Hello everyone. Today's topic is wireless security. So when we were talking about stream ciphers, we briefly talk about GSM security or Bluetooth security and Wi-Fi security. But now uh, it's a good time to focus more on Wi-Fi security. So we will briefly mention what kind of new threat this uh, wireless technology uh, introduces. Then we will focus on this IEEE 802.11 uh, family of standards, and we will talk about the security of these uh, protocols, Web WPA and WPA2. So let's start. Uh, one of the main problems with the uh, wireless uh, world is that now people can eavesdrop in an easier way because data is broadcast using electromagnetic radiation. There is nothing preventing anyone in range from picking up these signals. So this is uh, one of the threats introduced by uh, wireless technology. And the other one is unauthorized access. An attacker in range can uh, send wireless signals to the network devices. The attacker does not have to plug in using a physical cable. This might lead to unauthorized access to the network. And man in the middle attack, of course, a man in the middle attack is always possible in always all scenarios. But here uh, we are uh, talking about the differences between wired and wireless networks, because an attacker can present itself to a client as the legitimate access point. Because in a wired connection, if you can see the cable, and if you can see the two ends of the cable, you know that which device is connected to which device. So in order to perform a man in the middle attack, somebody has to cut in the line and you know introduce itself to the network. But uh, this is a lot easier in a wireless network because using the SSID uh, of the legitimate uh, access point, an attacker might claim that they are also a legitimate access point. So another thing is session hijacking. An attacker can hijack an already established session between a client and an access point. The attacker presents itself as the client to the uh, access point. The attacker blocks signals from the actual client. Replay attacks. An attacker can record, record legitimate packets from the client and later retransmit these to the access point. And a denial of service attack, an attacker can use a jammer to disrupt wireless communication. So this is always possible. So uh, let's move on to wireless LAN overview and see what OSI network model looks like. So this is a conceptual model that standardizes the communication functions of a telecommunication or computing system. So it partitioned the communication systems into seven abstraction layers. Each layer depends on the services provided by the layer below it. Each layer fully encapsulates implementation details. Therefore, a layer does not know anything about the particular implementation of the layer below it. So this is how the OSI network model looks like. We have seven layers. Uh, the top three generally refer to as upper layer and the bottom four uh, are referred to as uh, lower layers. And this is actually, uh, informally, you can think about that the bottom part is the hardware part and the upper part is the software part. So these layers are from top to bottom are application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. So here are some examples for all of these layers. For the application, we have HTTP, FTP, SMTP, and so on. These are the protocols we use for communication through the internet. And presentation is, can be the, an image or a video file. A session can be things like Apple Talk or Winsock. At the transport layer, we already talked about it in our previous lectures. Uh, we have TCP, UDP, or that kind of protocols at the network layer. Now we are at the router level. So we have uh, protocols like IP, ICMP, IPX. And at the data link, uh, we are at the switch or bridge layer. So at the bottom, we can talk about the physical layer. Here we have hub or repeater. So um, some people ask, what is the difference between a repeater 
and the root root switch. So repeater just actually uh, repeats uh, the communication it receives. So this way you can actually extend the uh, coverage of a network. So they just replay the uh, signals they receive. So IEEE standards are this 802.11, which uh, I think everybody is familiar. Uh, they have once seen it when they are modifying their uh, router settings or network adapter settings. So these are actually a group of specifications for wireless LANs. Uh, released by Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. First VLAN uh, standard adapted in 1997. And this, this standard defines the following layers for wireless local area networks. The physical layer and media access control layer, shortened as LAN and MAC. So uh, this standard uses the ISM, Industrial Scientific and Medical Radio Band, which is released for unlicensed use. So generally it is from between one to six gigahertz. And uh, now we should talk about Wi-Fi Alliance. The first standard to gain broad industry acceptance was 802.11b. The Wireless Ethernet Compatibility Alliance is an industry consortium that was formed in 1999 to allow interoperability between products from different vendors. So this is important nowadays we have um, almost never use uh, two devices that are from the same you know, vendors. Weka was later renamed to the Wi-Fi Alliance. Now it is a nonprofit organization that promotes Wi-Fi technology and certifies Wi-Fi products. Wi-Fi conformant devices conforms to specific uh, critical elements of this standard. So let's look at the physical layer that comes from this uh, standard. So this is the lowest layer of the OSI model. This interface between the data link layer, MAC, and the physical wireless media, in other words, electromagnetic radiation. Functions include encoding, decoding of signals, and bit transmission reception. It defines uh, frequency bands, modulation, and antenna characteristics. And uh, if you have a good uh, adapter, you can uh, modify with these uh, characteristics, actually defines how to transmit and receive data frames defined in the MAC layer over the air. And the original standard provided two modulation types, frequency hopping spread spectrum and direct sequence spread spectrum. But of course, uh, nowadays we have different uh, modulation types too. These both support one and two megabits per second data rates. Over the years, new generations of protocol introduced and new modulation types and requirements that support greater bandwidth. So I took a screenshot from Wikipedia. So the, I think this table is uh, even updated in very short periods because these standards, new standards are added or modified. So for our discussion, now we are looking at one to six gigahertz where we have these uh, protocols which you, know, you can see with uh, B, A, or AC at the end. So these different standards actually allows you different bandwidth and different uh, stream data rate. So most probably everybody is familiar with 2.4 and 5 gigahertz because when you buy a router, uh, they're uh, talking about this, but actually your adapter can, uh, your antenna can send it can use different frequencies too. So if you have a good adapter, you can use 5.1 or 5.2 or 5.5. And if your device supports this kind of frequency, they can communicate with your router. And if not, they wouldn't even see the SSID. So all of these have uh, different bandwidths. But uh, another important thing is the latency. So for instance, if you're streaming a, a full HD video, or if you are using a virtual reality headset, which is wireless and which supports uh, full HD communication, then it is suggested that you use five gigahertz instead of 2.4. And these standards are actually now uh, contains 
uh, some other uh, frequencies, let's say, for millimeter wave. I think this is from the, this has the spectrum from 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. And uh, we also have sub one gigahertz for IoT devices, which uh, so that they actually consume less battery. And uh, communication with light is currently a hot topic. So in maybe short distances, for instance, inside the room, if you need to uh, transfer huge amounts of data, it might be better to use light communication instead of uh, wireless communication. So let's move on to the second one that there are standard uh, specifies media access control layer MAC. So at the beginning of the course, we talk about message authentication codes, which we shortened also as MAC. And I also reminded you that you shouldn't uh, mistake this with the message media access control. So this MAC is not a message authentication code. So uh, MAC corresponds to the data link layer, provides means for controlling access to the transmission that provides reliable data delivery, performs the following functions on transmission, assemble data into a frame, and they use MAC protocol data unit, MPDU, with address and error detection fields. On reception, this, uh, they disassemble the frame and perform address recognition and error detection and govern access to the LAN transmission medium. MPDU format has something specific and it contains the following information. MAC control, which is protocol control information, destination MAC address, source MAC address, MAC service data unit, and CRC, uh, which is cyclic redundancy check field. And uh, it is also um, known as the frame check sequence FCS. So probably we mentioned this before, but it is also a good time to talk about coding theory here. So if you want to transmit, for instance, a one byte of data, sending that bytes alone uh, might not be a good idea because it might be modified through the transmission. For instance, if you're sending in a wireless communication, uh, due to the events in the nature, uh, some of the bits might flip, some of them might drop and so on. So this um, redundancy checks are actually allows you to detect if a, a, a modification to the bits were happened. So this is why we use coding theory to uh, eliminate this kind of problem. So in, uh, in nature, we see that uh, the errors introduced through the air uh, happens as if it is a Gaussian distribution. So for this reason, uh, you can increase the uh, signal, but uh, the power of the signal. But what we do is actually use more than one antenna and we put these antennas as far as to each other. So this way, even if one of the signals sent by the one antenna uh, introduces a error, the other one most probably would not uh, have that error. So this is why we have more than one antennas in our routers. And this way we can actually reach higher speeds. I mean, in terms of bandwidth and streaming data rate. So uh, we have two operation modes for these standards. Uh, the first one, which is not that much used, but it is the ad hoc mode independent basic service set. And the one that we use in our daily lives most of the time is the infrastructure mode, which is also called as basic service set. So let's look at the ad hoc mode. In the ad hoc mode, stations communicate with each other directly. So for instance, 10 people with their mobile phones can create an ad hoc network. So this way they can communicate with each other. And you can also in introduce laptops and so on. So there's no central infrastructure here. It's formed on the fly. Devices have to be near one another and it is isolated from other networks. So this way uh, your actually coverage is determined by the uh, range of the antennas of all of the devices. So if people get far, uh, far away from each other, it will turn into divided. It will be divided into two uh, networks and so on. 
but uh, there might be good real use cases for this for instance in the case of uh, disasters like earthquakes and so on when there's no when there's a problem with the infrastructure this might be a very good way to you know create a network and communicate with each other the thing we use in our daily lives is the infrastructure mode so we the stations communicate with a central access point so it could be your mobile phone it could be your laptop but for instance in a university at a department in a building you have an access point and your device actually communicates with that access point. The access point acts as a bridge between the wireless network adapter to, as, and to another network adapter. So most of the time, that access point is connected to the main network with an Ethernet cable, but it provides your wireless communication. An access point is identified by, by its service set identifier, SSID. The SSID can be advertised by sending beacon management frames at fixed intervals. So this is why uh, whenever you go out and you know uh, turn on your Wi-Fi, you would detect most probably more than 20 Wi-Fi communications in a coffee shop or in a mall and so on. So because all of the SSIDs are broadcast, but you can also hide the SSID. Uh, in this case, the client that knows the SSID has to send a probe request frame. So this looks like a very good idea because it provides you more security because when people check for the available connections, they wouldn't uh, realize uh, your SSID and they cannot uh, try to connect to the network without knowing the SSID. When I was doing PhD at Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne, uh, in Switzerland in 2010, the campus network for academics were using an SSID that was hidden. So initially I didn't have any problem, but at some point I bought an ebook reader, which has Wi-Fi capability, but I couldn't connect that device to this network because that device was not as uh, complicated as a laptop and it didn't have the property that allows you to you know, write the SSID by yourself. So I couldn't connect that device to the uh, internet. So you might think that, okay, that was 10 years ago. Now we have powerful devices. So all, they support almost all of the protocols so you can use them. But due to the uh, advances in IoT technology and smart home technologies, the devices you buy are not that uh, capable. You know, they wouldn't, uh, most of them wouldn't allow you to uh, insert the SSID yourself. So this might, uh, hiding the SSID uh, might prevent some devices to connect to the network. So although it sounds good, most of the time uh, we prefer not to use it. So uh, let's look at the extended service set, ESS. This consists of two or more BSSs interconnected by a distribution system, DS. So at the university, actually, this is what happens. You have more than one infrastructure and you know you have, you have more than uh, one BSS. But the ES, this extended service, appears as a single logical local area network. Now let's move on to uh, the services provided by this standard. They can be listed as association, authentication, deauthentication, disassociation, distribution, integration, make service data unit, MSDU delivery, privacy, and reassociation. So let's focus on a few of these, starting with association. Association related services are as follows. Before peers can exchange data, they have to associate. The association establishes an initial association between a station and the access point. The association enables an association to be transferred from one access point to another in the same ESS, allowing mobility. So this is actually what happens when you use your uh, Wi-Fi device when you're walking in a building, because most probably you will uh, leave the reach of an access point, but move on to the area of another access point. So the reassociation actually allows you to stay connected all the time. This association is a notification from either the station or an access point 
to terminate an existing association. So actually you're sending a frame uh, saying that you want to disassociate with the MAC address of the device. But this leads to you know, disassociation or the authentication attacks, which can be mounted when the attacker knows your MAC. So the attacker can simply send your MAC and claim that you want to disassociate. So all of a sudden you realize that your uh, device is disconnected from the network. So there's an amendment for this. It is referred to as uh, you know, this standard with W at the end. And this amendment can prevent this kind of disassociation, the authentication attacks, because in this scenario, uh, this frame about disassociation and the authentication are also encrypted, but uh, both of the devices should support this uh, amendment in order for that to work. Discovery phase. In order to begin the association process, discovery has to take place. If the SSID is advertised, the access point broadcasts beacon management frames at fixed intervals. If the SSID is hidden, the client station has to send a probe request frames specifying the SSID. The access point responds with a probe response frame. As I just mentioned, in order for you to use that, your device should be capable of sending a probe request. Authentication. The next in the association process after discovery is authentication. There are three types of authentication in this standard. First one is open system, but actually this is not an authentication. This means that everybody can join and use this network. Uh, the second authentication method is the shared key. And the third one is MAC address based access control list, ACS. So let's look at the first one open system authentication. This is actually the default authentication protocol for this standard, but of course this doesn't provide any security. It has a misleading name because there's no authentication here. It does not do any checks when authenticating. Clients are authenticated by default. Of course, nowadays almost nobody uses this kind of uh, networks because uh, somebody connecting to the network might do some illegal activities. So for this reason, people uh, providing this kind of services have to keep a log of who connected or not and so on. The second authentication method is shared key authentication. This requires a pre-shared key, PSK, to be installed on both the client and the access point. Use a standard challenge response mechanism. So for this reason, for this topic, maybe you should go back to password-based key derivation when we talk weeks ago. There we also mentioned how that kind of thing works in our routers. And the third one is MAC address-based access control list. Authent this authenticates clients by checking against the whitelist the set of MAC addresses. This is not secure because MAC addresses are easy to spoof. And you know you can change the MAC address of a device, and uh, you can listen and capture the MAC addresses of other devices. So uh, you know that you should have more uh, uh, checks in order for this to work uh, in a better way. 